how to do very simple maps of species distributions. I'm just going to take you up through dots on maps. I'm not going to take you into niche modeling because we need another couple weeks for that at least. We'll be giving a course on that online, as I said yesterday, starting in January. So tune into that if you're interested. <laughs> so again, we went to occurrences. We searched for some species. And it immediately automatically filters. And then we hit the download button. And we chose the simple. Okay, so I'm going to assume you have a zip packet on your computer and you're welcome to just follow along. Why don't we do this? First time, watch me. I've got three. Okay, first time, watch me. Don't do it. Second time, we'll go through it step by step, everybody together. Okay, so. Okay, here are my zip packets. I don't remember which is which, but I know that one's Corvus Albus because it's 12 megabytes. The other two, notice they are one and two kilobytes. So I'm just gonna unzip that one. Okay, now it's a CSV file, right? But you guys know that it's not a CSV. It's not comma separated values. It's tab separated. And so the best thing to do is to go into Excel if Excel will work. Go ahead and open a sheet. Again, don't do this. I'll, I'll, I'll go through it two more times if you want. Um, and in Excel, you're going to go to Import. And immediately it pops up and says CSV file. No, we want text file because it says when separated by tabs or spaces. It asks you to tell which file. Okay, and there is my CSV file, which is not a CSV file. Okay, so we get this wizard coming up, which means it's a series of windows that walks us through the importation process. First thing you want to make sure is that it's chosen delimited, which is to say there's some character that says next field. Okay, this fixed width is mainly an older, call, uh, an older format but sometimes it's used still, and that might be, you know, the first four columns are one data field, and the next three columns are another data field. But that's very rare now. So use the delimited, go to next, and then you see it's set at tab, that's what we want. We don't want tab and comma, okay? Because we only want to delimit fields at tabs. And, so you, and you can also look down here at this sample and you see that it's correctly separating the different fields. Um, we don't need to do anything about the data formats unless you see that it's messing something up, but we're not going to use many columns here and it won't have trouble with them. So I'm just going to hit finish and have it bring into the existing sheet. This one's going to take a little bit of time because it's 190,000 records. Okay. Any questions so far? So I'm going to, I just want to show you all of the fields that are in this, uh, that are in this data set that you just brought down. At least one of you brought down the full data set and you will suffer the consequences because it's even bigger. Okay, it'll take forever to import. But it's not a big thing. So this is the simple download and you have these 
identification codes. You have taxonomy, which comes down to there. You have locality, which is all of this. You have time, which is that. Okay. And then we have a bunch of other uh, connections and things like that, kind of ancillary information. But really the basis of these data records is taxon, place, and time. Because that tells us who, what, and where, right? Or who, when, and where, I should say. So, out of all of this, for this exercise, all we want is the species name, latitude, and longitude, okay? We, we could keep the whole table, and if we were gonna do a complex data cleaning exercise, we would keep the whole table, but as it is for today, we just need those three fields. So I'm gonna go ahead and isolate those fields. So I want the species name, Let's see. So I'm going to delete columns A through I, and I'm left with just the species name. You can, if you want, have the authority, but I'll just tell you that the authority gets messy, okay? So it's usually better to use just the species name, and then we're gonna get rid of all of these columns. Sorry, it's a little hard to control this. Out through column L, and then after column M. Okay, and so notice I'm left only with species, decimal latitude, and decimal longitude. That's it. Okay. Yes. Notice that there are there's a lot of information in this table. And for various applications, you may want to keep other fields. For example, if I'm doing niche modeling, it's not enough just to have the latitude and longitude. I probably want this coordinate uncertainty in, me in meters. Because for some records, the coordinate uncertainty is 10,000 kilometers. Like maybe it's, you know, it's, maybe the locality is Southern Hemisphere. <coughs> or Africa. Okay? You might, Go ahead. You might also want to know when those records were collected. So if you're interested only in, say, the breeding range of a species for whatever reason, you might want to actually have the month or the day or, um, yeah, the month that it, that record was collected. So you, these other fields could be uh, quite important, but for right now, we're just mapping a species in, um, in a GIS framework. Yeah, you may want to restrict it only to records after 1950 or after 1990. Okay, so there's a lot more information here, but for this one thing, all we want is these records, these three columns, okay? Now, you remember that we have a lot of duplicate records, so look at those two records, same species and exactly the same latitude and longitude. So we can uh, remove the duplicates or we can just leave them. It doesn't make a lot of difference between probably you know, 60,000 versus 100 and 180,000 records. It won't matter much. If you want to do that, you would go to data and then in this, which is the filtering panel, you'd go to advanced. Okay, notice I had already um, blocked out where my records are, but you can check that blocking by, by 
essentially blocking it out. See, there's 196,000 records. And then I'm going to tell it to filter the list. And again, it's going to take some time. Because what it's doing is it's checking every item in that list to make sure it's different from every other item in that list. So it's a lot of comparisons. Now bear in mind, you guys wanted mapping species distributions. What we're going to map is knowledge of species distributions. Okay? We're going to map the digital accessible knowledge for each species distribution. That's very different from the true distribution. There are regions that have never been sampled. That are re there are regions that have been at war or, or uh, in political difficulties for years or decades, and so there may not be records from those regions. <coughs> Okay, so there's a lot of reasons why sometimes we don't have data. And so you always have to remember this, is, this information is presence only. It's positive only data. Okay, and it's a lesson that a lot of people forget, in, especially in the field of distributional ecology. They forget that absence of a record doesn't mean absence of the species necessarily. Obviously this species is not present at the North Pole. Right? But it may not be re represented by a record from Kigali. And that doesn't mean it's not here. Okay? It means that Either it's not here, or it is here and hasn't been reported. So that ends up being a, a very consistent bias and a consistent con complication for anything we do with this di digital accessible knowledge of biodiversity. It's only presences. There are things that we can do to guess at absences. So imagine we have two sites. One site is 100 kilometers from the nearest road and is completely uninhabited. And another site has tens of thousands of records of other species, but not the species we're interested in. Well, the first site, the, the remote one, the lack of a point from that site doesn't mean much, okay? It doesn't tell us much because it's completely logical that our species would not be reported there even if it was there. <coughs> the second one, the, spe the place that has lots and lots of, of data from it, that site, the absence of a point there makes a lot of, makes a lot of, uh, has a lot of importance. That may actually be real absence. So essentially what we can do is compare presence or absence against the effort that has been expended at that site. Okay? That works for taxa that have been sampled intensively. Best example, birds. Or it works for sites where some sort of trapping or sampling has definitely been there. So think of you know, the, the mosquito traps that medical entomologists put out. <coughs> Usually whatever is in those traps at the end of a night is identified and recorded. And so we could use kind of all of the cumulative trapping effort to say, okay, we've got a ton of trapping effort here and no record of my species. And I've got no trapping ref record, no trapping effort here, and no records of my species. We'd pay more attention to the first case, because that's a more meaningful absence. Okay? Okay, everybody. I'm going to 
I'm going to catch back up to myself. Listen up, please. I'm going to catch back up to myself and use a smaller example. That was a bad decision of mine. So, <coughs> just to go back through this again, this will be quick. Import a text file. You, you, most all of you have done this now. And I'm going to get my smaller species, which is this one. Delimited, tab only. <coughs> Check to make sure that it is properly parsed. It is. And I want to put it on the existing sheet. And then all I want is the species. Let's see. <coughs> so there's my species name. This is a really cool uh, Franklin that was only discovered a relatively few years ago, if I remember right. Franklin? Francolin. Oh, okay. They're, they're, <laughs> they're partridges. <laughs> uh, and then I want decimal latitude and decimal longitude. And so notice I'm just deleting all of the columns except that. Okay? So there's my nice little matrix with, you know, 20 records instead of 200,000. But notice I've got duplicates in there. Okay? You see them? So I want to get rid of those duplicates. And so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to select the whole matrix. I'm going to go to data. And in this filtering, advanced filtering, and watch what I do. I just hit this unique records only. And wa watch these records here that are the duplicates. And it reduced down to many fewer records but each one has a unique combination of species, latitude, and longitude. And then I'm just going to copy that onto a new sheet. And so now you can see I have a nice little table. And this is going to be very easy to take into my GIS. So instead of saving it as an Excel file, I'm going to save it as comma separated values. Okay, this is real comma separated values. And this is Xenoperdix. Okay, and it's telling me, hey, you're working in an Excel spreadsheet that has multiple sheets. So by saving it in CSV format, you may be losing some information. That's fine. All I want is this little table. Okay? So there is my CSV file. For the people who I've talked with so far this morning and for years and years and years, so much time and confusion is revolving around, where did I put that file? Okay? So just pick one directory, call it, you know, Towns Demo, 26 September, or whatever, but put everything in one place, okay? And of course you're keeping notes in your notebook if this is at all serious. Anyhow, there's my file. I'm going to go into QGIS. going to take a half hour to load. There we go. I want just a new <coughs> project. Oops. Okay, I'm going to go into this Open Data Source Manager. I want this option, Delimited Text. Okay, you guys have used this for vector and raster. 
and that would be here or here. Or you can, you can say load a vector file as a, as a separate uh, command, but using this data source manager, you can bring in all sorts of different kinds of files. We're going to bring in delimited text. So you browse for that file. There's Xenoperdix. Okay. You open it. And I think it's a good idea just to work down through all of this. What's my file format? This first part. CSV. Okay, so I'm good there. Record and field options. This is if you need to make some adjustments about what part of that CSV file you're using. And so, for example, you might tell it to ignore an initial five lines. We don't have any of that. Okay, so don't worry about that. Now here's the, the crucial one, geometry definition. It's remembering that the last thing I did was to, to import an attribute only table. That was from our last exercise. But in this case, it's point coordinates. Okay, so I select that, and this comes up, and it says, what's your X field? Well, my X field is longitude. What's your Y field? Latitude. What's your coordinate reference system? It's our old friend WGS84. And then the other way that you're going to detect a lot of problems is this sample data. And all, what we can see is that it's parsed nicely into Xenoperdix versus latitude versus longitude. Okay? So at this point, all you would do is hit add. But I, wanted, I want you to see what happens when, when there's a problem. So let's, let's say I had the wrong delimiter and I had this, okay? So there it's delimited by space and so look down at my sample data. It split the species from the genus. There's no space so it kept species, epithet, longitude and latitude all together or latitude and longitude, okay? So I see this and I know I've got a problem because I want these together and this and this separate. So I'm going to go back up and I'm going to say, oh yeah, this was comma separated. So it's easiest if I do that. And now I see it parsed the way I want it, okay? Now, this can hold you up quite a bit. If you've got a bigger table, with more fields, and especially if there are some text fields that have commas and spaces in them, you may have to do several trips back and forth between fixing things in Excel and trying them out to see, to see if they're parsing right in QGIS. Okay? So this is not always an easy step. For this exercise, it better be. Okay? So I'm going to hit Add, and let's see what I get. Look at that, I have some dots. Okay? So life's pretty good, I think. Now, there, these dots are not very far apart. Look at the, down here, you can see the minimum latitude is negative eight, negative 7.9, and the, the maximum latitude is negative four. And my longitude goes from 36 something to 36 something. So this is a tiny distribution. Okay? And the weird thing is when these points import is you don't know if you're looking at the whole world or two square meters. And so you have to look down at your coordinates to be able to understand how close am I best thing that you can do is just bring in some reference maps. So let's go back to our data source manager and let's find some vector data. Now in this case I know I have a stash of data that I've downloaded from that Diva GIS site that you guys, several of you have used. Okay, but this is just kind of my stash of information. And I probably want to see, I know this is in Africa, 
So I'm going to bring in Africa and I'm going to add it. Ah. And the winner is? Tanzania. That's right. So look at that species. That's its whole known range. Okay? It's a cool species. Okay, it's a little bit hard unless you really know Tanzania. It's a little bit hard to say, oh, where is that? So, so we can get, uh, no, uh, we can get some more information. Uh, if you go to that Diva, Diva GIS site, you can get all the administrative data for your, for your region. Let's see. Do I really not have Tanzania? <laughs> that's unbelievable. Yesterday, Gabriel Anthony and I found something that's kind of cool. If you go to, so hit oh. close. Close. And then go to your browser. So well, you have to be connected to do this. I, I am connected. connected. Okay, my browser as in. You know how you'll have a, so go to view uh -huh. and then panels. 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 On the bottom, all the ah, okay. And then browser. And then in there, you see the X, Y, Z tiles. Yeah. Like button next to it, and hit Open Street Map. Ah, okay. And you'll have to change the color. Just right click and oh yeah. yeah. You have to be connected in order to do this because it loads from the internet. Okay. But it okay. Gives you a nice little. So, yeah, that's really nice. Thank you. Notice, every time you talk with somebody different, you learn, something. you learn something, right? I mean, this is just something where I've always done things my way, but here's a neat way to, to learn a nice base map. And now I'm going to do something more. I want to see my country borders on top of that nice base map. So I'm going to make this, I'm going to go to simple fill and say, Use a fill style of no brush. Okay? I hit OK, and now look what I have. Okay? So, this is not in Gorogoro. This is, I believe there's some low hills, right? There's a national park there. Yeah, it is. Ah, where, where? Udzungwa. <laughs> <laughs> and in fact, the specific epithet is Xenoperdix, which means weird partridge. Xenoperdix udzungwanzensis. Okay? So somebody who, who discovered and, and described this species was basically saying, I'm going to name it after the place where it was found, which is quite common now. <coughs> Instead of after their daughter, favorite daughter, or favorite daughter. <laughs> <laughs> so the other thing you could show them is downloading um, World Clean data and plotting it on like rainfall or temperature. We can do that. I, I don't think we want them downloading mm -hmm. the data because it it won't download for everybody. Mm -hmm. Now you can do all sorts of um, base maps. Okay, this is a, a political view, right? And so we saw, oh yeah, this is in a, a national park and it's in Tanzania. But we could put those points on top of any information. So let me see what raster data I have. Okay. Yep, oh, sorry, that was vector. Raster. And I'm going to go back to my stash of data. And as you guys do more and more GIS work, some of the things that you generate or that you find will be just for one project. But many of them will be for your whole country or for the whole world. And so create a general stash for yourself or even for your institution of here's a stash of GIS data. So for, for example, I have a stash of elevation data. Okay, this is, this is just raster data describing elevations around the world. And so, 
I get again a view. I can probably make this a more useful view by turning it into something like that. Okay. I want my political boundaries on top of that. And then I can probably make this DEM a little more informative. Ah, <sighs> boy. No. Okay. So I essentially just said, give me, give me elevations between 0 and 3,000 and scale my, um, my color ramp to that. And now we see very clearly this is a highland species. Okay? Just in case not all of you have these data for your countries, again, I'm surprised that I don't have the DIVA packet for, for this country because I've visited Emmanuel there. But I can go to Diva GIS I can say country and this gives me this nice data packet which is the different administrative levels for that country. I'm going to put this directly in my data stash because I know I want it. So, again, you guys wanted uh, map making for distributions of species. Ideally, we'd take a next step and we would do a niche model, okay? And we could do a quick and dirty niche model very easily, but I don't believe in quick and dirty, okay? If you're gonna do a niche model, I want you to do it right. So, I think this is enough that it basically suggests to you and indicates to you um, what are the, the basic steps in, in getting a map? Um, I want you to see the second level and third level uh, administrative div divisions. This is still finishing up. So you can get the Diva GIS package for your country. It's not highest quality data. It has some little errors in it, but it's, it's plenty good for, so it's unpacked. It's plenty good for this basic mapping. So I'm gonna go into vector, and I want to go into that Tanzania directory. There it is. Now notice it says admin zero. That's the outline of the country. And then admin one will be states, or what is it called in Tanzania? Divisions? The, the biggest ones. Regions. Regions. And what's admin two? Districts. Districts. Okay, so I can add those. And now I have, those are regions and those are districts. Okay? And so we may want to play around with making a nice base map out of this where we, we show all of these levels. Again, this is, you know, I'm not a cartographer. I usually give cartographers nightmares. But I just want you to see real basics here. I can say I want no brush because I don't need my regions or districts filled. And I can say make my stroke color this nice kind of dark gray. Okay, and that looks like that. Okay, but I want my districts on top of that maybe a little clearer, a little more defined. So again, I'm gonna do no fill style, but I'll leave my, my stroke color 
black. And so now I get that. Okay? And so now we can see very clearly it's in two regions and looks like only two districts. But basically all we're doing is we have those point data from GBIF and we're just putting different information on the, uh, on the map to inform. And if you're talking to one person, maybe a, you know, somebody who is involved in the government, they want to know what region and what district this is in. This species that's found in, on two hills in the whole world. And another person who might be an ecologist wanted the elevation map or a map of rainfall or temperature. 